engagement. We'll do the same with the candidates once uh, Mayor Cole arrives. So thank you all for coming. My name is Melissa Henderson, and I am the manager of the Healthy by Design Coalition here in Yellowstone County, um, created as a partnership between Billings Clinic, Riverstone Health, and St. Vincent Healthcare. And I've had the privilege of working with Jed Barton from Living Independently for Today and Tomorrow, and Christy Drake of Billings Trailnet to organize this walkability and accessibility forum. Hello. Um, we are just so excited to have the opportunity to have this dialogue with our candidates for city leadership. Um, this isn't about us endorsing any one idea or candidate, but really bringing this issue to the forefront. So thank you all for coming and showing your civic engagement and interest in this topic. And then to our candidates, thank you all for taking the time out of your busy schedules to make this a priority. So thank you. A few items of housekeeping. We move the trash can within view. So if you need the trash can, it's directly behind the, the audience now. Um, there are snacks, there's a sign-in sheet. Please feel free to get up, mingle, that's okay. Just, you know, the, the focus will be up here. For questions, so we've prepared questions for our candidates and we have sent them out in advance. So they know what we're going to ask. Um, towards the end of the session, closer to two, we're gonna stop asking the questions and we're going to open the floor to you all. In hope of kind of keeping things brief and moving at a quick pace, we're gonna ask that you write questions on little pieces of paper that Rahia is holding up in the back. So if you didn't grab one, you can grab one and maybe she can pass some out. Um, you're welcome to hold on to your question till the end, or if you, you're like, all right, I'm ready, you can put it in that green basket over here and we'll just pull them out and read them at the end. If we run out of time, we are going to collect the responses from our questions as well as yours from the candidates via email. So we'll ping that out. Our goal with this, and I don't know if we've told the candidates, is we are gonna create a summary of what they've said about the issues so that we can all kind of see where they're landing on the themes as we go to that ballot box. Um, let's see, is there anything else? This is being recorded live by Community 7 Television, so thank you to them. It's on Facebook Live, and then it'll be um, streamed later as well. We have one more panel next week, so that'll be exciting as well. Um, and now we're gonna kick it off with the questions. So some rules here. The three of us are gonna alternate who is asking the question, and we're also gonna alternate who gets to answer it first. So you guys are not only on your toes for the responses, but remembering who goes when. Um, Let's see, each candidate will be given up to two minutes to respond, and Miss Morgan Miller here has a timer, and she'll be giving you the 20-second warning, and Morgan looks nice, but she is fierce. <laughs> so get ready. Um, and without further ado, I think we'll, we'll get started. So what I'm gonna have you do, candidates, is I am going to have you introduce your name and your ward as part of your answer to question one, okay? So question one for you is, according to a national survey by the AARP, eight in 10 people surveyed prefer living in a walkable community, and six in 10 prefer places with easy walkable access desti to destinations. How important is walking, biking, rolling, and public transportation to Billings' quality of life and economic vitality? And we'll start with Mayor Cole, and then we'll go to his left. So then I'll go Ed, then Mary. Yes, please use the mics. Great question. Okay, great, thank you. Um, thanks everybody, uh, Trailnet, other sponsors for this opportunity and thank you for all for being here. This is an important uh, topic. So, um, uh, again, the question, according to national survey, AARP, eight in 10 people surveyed prefer living. Uh, uh, six and 10 preferred living places with easy walkable access. Uh, what do you think about that? How important are those things? It's sort of strange that that should be a question, right? Because what should be controversial about having a place that you could, uh, a city where you can walk around? But it is, um, because it, nothing is free. And uh, we're in a world of uh, ha having to allocate resources. But um, for me, um, I think what we've seen, I, I was on the planning board uh, 15 years ago, and I remember uh, getting into gentle struggles with developers who did not want a trail anywhere near them because it would bring crime. And who's gonna maintain it, and et cetera, et cetera. 
And the reality is that we've passed those issues long ago. And now many developers are saying, well, what do I have to do to make sure I get this trail uh, along my development? So Billings has come a long ways, and it's because uh, of two things. One is uh, just people re recognize the, uh, the function, the value, the need of uh, a walkable, uh, bikeable community, getting kids to school. Uh, it, this is, these are resources that cut across all age groups. Everybody um, uh, appreciates it. Everybody understands better the uh, uh, equities involved. Uh, but more than just the function, uh, people are also realizing that even if they're not on that trail using it, they like the look of it. It really changes the tone and the atmosphere of a community for the better. Um, and uh, just driving up and down Shiloh, it makes me excited to see people using it. So um, those things are important to me. Pass it down. All right. Yes, uh, good afternoon. And again, thanks so, to having to all entities that put together this forum. I'm Ed Gulick with, uh, uh, I am a candidate in Ward 1. And um, yeah, I believe the opportunities for, for active transportation and accessibility are really critical for um, both the economic well-being of our community as well as the health of our community. And, and, and walking and biking and a high level of public transit um, are better for everyone, for the whole community, not just those who use it. Um, it's better for kids and their independence, their ability to, to get on, on to school on their own, not, and it's better for their parents. Their parents don't need to drive them everywhere, it, it, so it's, it frees them both. It's better for older adults and their health and their independence and their connection to the community. It's better for uh, those who, who aren't able to drive for, for a variety of reasons. Um, it's better for those who do drive because it means that there's less competition for space on our streets. There's less congestion. Um, there is such a thing as a mode shift that happens. Um, it's good for property taxpayers because we don't have to pay for expensive infrastructure expansions of, of, our, of our roadways if we have less people um, using those. Um, it's good for people experiencing poverty who now have funds available for them to, uh, for quality food, rent, and, and health care instead of being forced to support a car for a job. Um, but this discussion needs to be, be about more than just our transportation systems. It need, we need to have the right kind of development patterns as well that support a mix of modes. We need, I mean, surveys have found that uh, a lot of people in Billings want to see uh, infill development uh, rather than continuing with sprawl to sprawl outwards and we need to have the right kind of infill development that is walkable walkable districts and I'll talk more about that uh, in another time uh, apparently because uh, I'm out <laughs> good afternoon I want to thank uh, the Billings Trail Net uh, Lift and Healthy by Design for sponsoring this uh, today and for you um, uh, attending uh, I'm Mary Hernandez, and I am a candidate in Ward 4, and um, I have, I say that Billings is, has been our chosen home for 41 years, and we chose to move here because of all the wonderful amenities uh, that Billings and the area has to offer. And I believe that if we want to uh, continue to foster growth of our community, invite new families to live here and to participate in activities, we need the connectivity of the trails that we have. In our family, the trails are used uh, most days of the week. And uh, so it is something that's very important to me, my family, friends, and I think our community. Um, I feel that, um, yes, for, um, you know, Mayor Cole already said that uh, for those that had reservations uh, early on about um, crime and, and how, how um, trails would affect uh, them and their neighborhoods and so forth, um, you know, we certainly know that, now know that trails really help to connect people and actually increase the safety uh, as we have folks who use the trails and can keep an eye on, on uh, the environment around. Uh, I was very fortunate to be able to participate in the Chamber's basic crime prevention through environmental design, and that sort of fits into that program as well. So I feel that as we continue to grow and as we um, are concerned about the safety in our, in our uh, community and also being attractive to new 
and young families, it's critical that we uh, have uh, trails for uh, people of all ages. Thank you. All right, I think I'm on now. Thank you. All right, I'm uh, Tim Warburton. I am a candidate in Ward 4, and uh, glad to be here, and I'm glad that this topic is the first topic that uh, us as candidates get to talk about, because I believe it's pretty important. Um, I think the question uh, kind of answers itself when you want to know about um, how important is it. Eight out of 10 people prefer walkability and, and trails and parks in their community. And so uh, I agree with the eight and 10. Um, I wonder where the other two are. Um, but I, I think about, when I think about trails and, and how important it is to us, I think about uh, my neighborhood specifically uh, in Copper Ridge. It's filled with trails that connect us to our neighboring subdivision. Um, and it goes from top to bottom. And so it's always full of people. It's always full of kids riding their bikes, uh, people walking, people running, and of course their dogs. So um, I think about even today when I came down here and, and I, I frequently drive down Rimrock Road and there isn't many times you can drive down Rimrock Road and not see somebody uh, using it uh, in a bike uh, to recreate or walk um, or out there. So today on the way down here, I, I tried to count um, in between singing songs with my kids. And I, I counted at least 10 people out there, you know, uh, early morning, Friday, um, using the, the infrastructure that we have there. So obviously it's important, people prefer it, uh, and people use it. So I think um, we need to be good stewards of, of that and uh, do everything we can to make sure uh, the city and the people that live here can use those things to, to improve their quality of life. Thanks. Hi there. My name is Dennis Olvisid, uh, representing uh, Ward 5. I have been here for many years, many, many years. And I have uh, seen Billings change when we didn't have any trails. And I have looked over uh, many trails here in Billings, and we do need them. And the people that are putting them in TrailNet are doing a fantastic job. I think we have a little bit to go to get the complete loop, but to uh, ride the trails is, gives you a different perspective, and it gives you a great perspective when you're looking at it from a different perspective from your car than you are your bike. And what's good about these trails, when you're riding your bike, it kind of integrates with uh, you know, the Billings uh, Met Bus, you know, putting your bus, bike on the bus, and it ties right in. And we do have a very good chance here in Billings to complete our trails, and I have been on them, and especially the trail coming across the rims and across uh, up there at the park. And what people say when they come here, they say, well, what's in it for me? And we show them, uh, we have one of the best trails in the state of Montana. We have one of the most beautiful cities here tying in. And I w just wanted to uh, let you know that trails is a new quality of life for people because it will change your quality of life. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tom Rupsis. I'm running in uh, Word 5. Once again, I'd like to thank uh, TrailNet and, and Lyft and Healthy by Design for putting on today's forum. Um, personally, to me, walkability is very important to our quality of life. My family lives uh, just off the Shiloh Trail in Ward 5, uh, and we use that trail almost daily. Uh, we can get down to the conservation area. We can get to Centennial Park now. We can get up to the, the Big Ditch Trail, um, and, and we use it all, and it's very important. Uh, we've lived there since before that trail was in. 
Uh, and since it's been in, um, we've had a few conversations, should we move neighborhoods or, uh, but we've always come back to the fact that we love our location right by that trail. Um, and as Miracle uh, you know, suggested, uh, developers see that too, and, and they're, um, they're trying to, to, to integrate into that network as, as much as they can. Uh, personally, I don't use the public transportation here in Billings very much, um, but I recognize that you know, that's as important to some people's quality of life as the trail system is to mine. Um, and I think that's important for prospective uh, council members to, to understand, is that we might not personally use a resource, uh, but its impact uh, goes beyond our own personal experiences. Uh, we need to recognize that and, and support uh, a, a community that um, represents the, the, the diverse uh, needs and, uh, and wants uh, that people have today. Um, people's expectations are changing. And we need to keep up with that. Um, our economic future depends on it. If we can't uh, adapt and, and grow with our population, uh, we've got an aging population, uh, people will just continue to move away. And we need to attract people here. We need to attract our kids to come back uh, after college. Uh, and you know, that's just very important to our economic future. So you know, quality of life and economic vitality, I think, are, are you know, directly linked. Uh, anything we can do to improve that is, is a good step, in my opinion. Sorry, you can keep the microphone down at that end because we are going to start again with at that end and move back down towards Mayor Cole here. Um, okay, the second question is: Much of our current transportation infrastructure excludes people who cannot drive for reasons of age, ability, or financial means, and as well as other reasons. Um, as city council members. What would you do to make sure that Billings accommodates the transportation needs, such as equitable access to employment, commerce, and services of all residents? Thank you. That's a great question. Um, in my mind, uh, this is this is a reason we can't get to autonomous, uh, self-driving vehicles fast enough. The ability to have cost-effective, on-demand, point-to-point transportation, I think, is a win-win for everybody. Um, obviously, that's not coming this year or probably even in the realm of uh, our potential terms on, on council, though. Um, so in the meantime, we need to uh, be um, very cognizant of balancing the costs of providing those services with the benefits that are received. Uh, we have, uh, I think the, the, the Met Transit site said uh, there are about 2,000 trips per day uh, on public transportation. Um, and 17 routes and over 13 hours of service, that's about eight or nine uh, riders per hour on, on a bus. And that's a, that's a lot of big uh, buses driving around with a, the seemingly low number on it. But I think we get into a problem when we start looking at the, the benefits um, just in terms of ridership counts. We need to consider the intangible qualities that, that people get from uh, public transportation, so, such as the autonomy to go and, and do their own grocery shopping or go to the store, to get to a job, to, to support their family. I think those things are all important and they have to play in, they have to be uh, considered as, as we consider uh, uh, policies uh, relating to public transportation. Um, you know, a couple, uh, so I definitely support policies that, um, you know, factor in all those intangible qualities. Uh, something um, more tangible though, is I, I think we need a better trip planner on the, um, on the Met Transit site. I was trying to figure out how I get from my house to somewhere and I couldn't do it. And the, the Met Transit site uh, has a form to fill out and they will email you back in a day or so. Um, I think that's just not good. We can do better than that today. Uh, we should have a better trip planner on the site. Thank you. Uh, to segue on what my candidate said, uh, He's absolutely right about the transportation here on getting rides and how do you get from one place to another. But I'm going to go one step further. I think the Met Transit, when I didn't have a car, I had an excellent, excellent transit people here and they got me from one place to another because these bus drivers here, they are second to none, you know, where they're driving you in the snow, rain, sleet, or whatever weather it may be. But I do think the people we have to do is to uh, 
do a little bit more research so we can get our people around town a lot faster. And in that way, I think that we have to all get together, not only us, not only our wards, one, two, three, four, five, but all wards so we can all work together and then we all can be part of the solution and not the problem. Thank you. Yeah, when I read this question, I um, added another group of people that can't drive, and that's folks that I worked with um, in the drug court program as a licensed addiction counselor. And so we as a society have decided that these people can't drive because of their actions. Um, and I, I agree with that. There needs to be a consequence. But then th we also expect these folks to get around. And when I looked at this question, some of the things that really stuck out to me from my work there was, um, you know, I didn't know this before I had worked there, and I assume most people don't know this if you don't use the public transportation, but the, the bus system uh, stops running after 645. And it would be great if the world stopped running after 645, but it doesn't, it keeps going. And so uh, it also doesn't run on Sunday. And so we have some real opportunities here to um, improve that quality of life for people that need to use it. Uh, again, it's not just age or, or ability, but um, there's lots of different reasons people can't drive, and our transit system uh, can be improved upon. Um, how would I do that? Um, specifically as a council member, um, we have lots of boards, lots of different committees that meet. Uh, the one that meets for the, the transportation is the Technical Advisory Committee. Uh, they report uh, their findings to the planning board, and, uh, and that kind of gets back to council. So I trust that the folks that are volunteering and passionate about that and, and learning those things are getting the information, um, vetting it, and then passing that on to council, um, where then we can make the best decision, decisions um, moving forward. So. Um, that would be some of the, the ways I would improve our, our transit system. Thanks. Thank you. So as I looked at this uh, question, it certainly, I had to think of my sister, uh, Diana, who actually has been my greatest inspiration in all that I've done in my life. Uh, she was bo born with cerebral palsy, so she relied on public transportation to get around. And it's not always easy because the routes, times, and things that have been um, stated before in any community, uh, certainly our Billings community, is uh, challenged by that. I also recall that when my daughter was in elementary school, we would take an adventure on the bus to do a movie day at the mall because that's where the uh, cinema was at at the time. And, uh, and actually um, uh, made it a fun day, uh, you know, once a week or a couple of times a month or whatever. Um, it becomes more difficult as, um, as our work schedules, you know, are varied as, and as well as all the activities that happen uh, around town. That's why I also like the trails because, you know, can they jump on a bike to get there or whatever, but um, uh, when there aren't enough cars or people or so forth. Um, one of the things that came to mind is, you know, there are a lot of smart people that certainly have tackled this issue before me, and I don't expect to have all the answers. Um, I think it's important to revisit, again, you know, what the latest uh, successes have been and where, where we need to go. One thing that did come to mind is working with the three sectors, the private, public, and nonprofit sectors, to come together to see if there's a way that we can find maybe stipends of some sort to help those employers that may have employees that, have, that can't afford a car or, or have difficult time. You know, can we have stipends with alternative types of transportation, the, the hours that fit them? Uh, or, you know, that would fit, allow them to work uh, beyond those hours that public transportation is not available. Likewise, for anyone else who is unable to get around on a, in a usual manner. Thank you. Um, I believe uh, uh, there's opportunity to reprioritize where some of our, our transportation dollars are spent. Right now, it's about $22 million in our, the budget that was just adopted um, for our arterial fee as well as our uh, gas tax money. Uh, the gas tax is only about a third of that, actually, So, um, as well as uh, some of our, our other funds. I'll get into the specifics later, but fully a third of, of, of uh, Americans uh, don't have a driver's license. So, so we are talking about a sizable number of people here. And, and a transportation that serves only one mode, uh, vehicular, is actually the most expensive 
inefficient system available. A multimodal is just a lot more cost efficient and delivers better human and, and environmental health, uh, better social equity, and better uh, community interaction than uh, uh, singly focused on, on automotive transit. Um, so why does our community continually treat walking and bicycling infrastructure as a, an optional premium that adds cost to our transportation system? It's because we see it as being additional. It's an add-on. We see it as that we were going to build out all the car infrastructure in any case, uh, and now this is something on in addition. But what happens when you, when you actually have a, a good functioning multimodal system is you are offsetting some of the needs of, of that congestion. Um, and, and so there's opportunities to um, reduce, avoid uh, costs and, and the most expensive types of infrastructure. Um, so, um, and, and when we combine good development practices with investments uh, in, in walking and biking, uh, and uh, well, another thing I'll add is also that it's very costly to provide good quality bus service when you have just low density development. So if we're really serious about addressing this, we need to be thinking about how we develop in the future, uh, and we can, uh, I have ideas, and I'll get the specifics in another time. <laughs> Uh, we do have a problem. Uh, we've come a long ways uh, in addressing all these uh, issues with ADA ramps, increasing the number of trails, uh, uh, making sure developers put in sidewalks. Uh, all of those things didn't exist even uh, in some cases 10, 20 years ago. So we've come a long ways, but we still have a long ways to go. I remember uh, driving down Grand frequently and seeing this gentleman who travels that in a motorized uh, scooter, um, which generally works, except there's not sidewalks all the way along Grand when you get far enough west. And come winter, he's just out in the uh, street. A uh, woman on the wheel, uh, or uh, with a dual st um, a stroller trying to go up Rimrock Road on the north side, you know, five foot sidewalk with uh, mailboxes uh, in the middle. And she has to go out into Rimrock uh, to, to get uh, through. Um, speaking to Association for the Montana Association for the Blind uh, a couple weeks ago and asked him, you know, what can we do to improve accessibility here? And, and a simple request that the, the volume of the signal that signals to the blind be increased because on a loud street they couldn't hear it. So what do we do? Well, we start with uh, a lot of attention on expanding the system, which is costly, which is fine, but we can at least start with enforcing what we've got now. Uh, which is our existing uh, uh, complete streets policy, safe routes to school, um, uh, making sure that trails, uh, wide sidewalks go in on arterials, um, and uh, uh, making sure that there's adequate width uh, in those sidewalks. So um, we're making progress, but there's a lot more to do. Just a quick uh, item on public transit. Um, it is very expensive, but uh, so many of those costs are already built into the system. If we can increase ridership, uh, that comes at almost no additional cost, but it is a way to generate more revenue. We, uh, we, we now have a good app system where you can actually know where the, where the bus is rather than guessing, uh, but we can improve the technology in the transit system at relatively low cost. Thank you. That'll go back to Ed Gulick. Thank you. All right. So this is a pretty simple question. Um, so you can expand on the things that you weren't able to say earlier. But specifically, some would say that no one uses trails or bike lanes and that they cost too much money to build and maintain. As a council member, what would you say to that? Well, for about 40 years, we invested almost exclusively in infrastructure uh, designed for, for vehicles. And so we kind of squeezed out the other modes. And that part of that's the way we developed as well. We, and, and so it's not a big surprise that, hey, there aren't um, a lot of people, uh, as many people biking and walking in a place like Billings as, as there are in some other communities that, that did have that infrastructure. Um, but uh, to the credit of, of the city of Billings, um, you know, for the last 20 years, we have been uh, definitely putting much bigger uh, uh, investments in, in, uh, in, in trails, also working with Billings Trailnet, um, and, and also uh, in making complete streets. Um, thank you, Healthy by Design. Um, but it's a big, it's like trying, trying to turn a big battleship around. And um, 
Um, and I want to jump on the bridge and turn that wheel a lot harder, I guess, is, is I, I'm really interested in doing. Um, I'm a small business owner. My lifeblood is uh, my ability to get uh, highly educated talent to work for me. Um, and they are looking for places where they can live a very healthy lifestyle, where they can connect to this amazing place. Um, I think it's, um, you know, speaking as a business owner, I don't think we can afford not to invest in those kinds of trails. That is absolutely a piece of our economic development strategy, and I think we, we don't invest in it at our peril. Uh, I know at my peril as a business owner. So, thank you. One more second. <laughs> um, I'll use his 24. Never mind. No. <laughs> Uh, so the question again, you know, how do I feel? Um, yes, a lot has been invested in the trails. And, um, and my question, I, I went back to what were the original expectations? Because a lot of times we forget uh, where we started at and what we've accomplished. So I am grateful that the current city council just approved the budget for the public information officer who might be able to go back and uh, create that narrative, the story of what has transpired over the years, what has been accomplished, what we have yet to do, and then uh, pick up from there with a group saying, where do we want to go from here? And what does the success look like prior to building or adding or whatever that we identify those things so that we can then celebrate those things when we're successful? It is so easy to go to the negative, we forget about celebrating what we have. So I think that's one thing. And I think that that would also encourage others to even use the trails and use our systems better and more, just like Mayor Cole had stated about how do we increase ridership? Any of those things can be, can be improved by, um, by, putting, by sharing our story about what we've accomplished and how we could do more. Um, so I think I'll leave it at that for the moment. Thank you. 30 seconds. Do I get your 30? <laughs> um, so the question asked how I felt about that, so I wanted to make sure I used the feeling word. In, uh, so I would say I feel contrarian to the sentiment that uh, we can't um, maintain it and it costs too much. Um, I would also say that the, the some people that, that think that probably aren't very aware of all the users that are currently using um, the bikes and trails that we currently have, which obviously poses a, a danger if they're unaware that people are out there uh, using those things. So I would say, kind of going back to Rimrock Road, I don't think there's any day of the year, 365 days, you'll find somebody using that road to bike, walk, um, and just get from you know one place to another. And so I, I think it's important. Um, also, I think it's one of those things, if you build it, they will come. So if the more bike paths we have, uh, the more bike lanes, the more walking paths, the more trails that connect to different parts of the city, the more people are gonna use them. And so in areas where we don't see um, bike lanes, we, we need to get bike lanes in there um, and you'll see people using it. Um, I'm a firm believer in that. Uh, I think Rimrock uh, kind of shows that it, as long as you have a safe place to travel on your bike or a safe place to walk uh, with your kids or your partner or your friends, then you'll do that. And so we need more safe places. Um, and kind of looking at the healthy part of that, the, our, our community has um, a real need to, to get out and recreate um, for, for physical health, mental health, and uh, we need to make sure we have those places for them. Thank you. I'm gonna take a little bit different uh, approach to this. What I would do if we have some negative feelings from people, oh, it's gonna cost money for the trails, it's gonna cost money for this and this and this. What I would do, what you should do, is you go out to your constituents, whoever is the negative person, actually you show them, you show them your, what's negative. You show them the trails, you show them the buses, and engage them because once you engage a person with you about 
why we need these trails and bikes. This way, they will feel like they are involved with the city and they were part of it, whether it be part of the solution or the problem. This way, if you show them what we are doing here, the engagement is much better and the person that you are showing, hey, that was good, he came out and engaged me, showing me that I am part of the city too. Thank you. Well, I think roads cost too much to build and maintain, uh, but obviously we're not gonna stop doing that. Um, I think the key for me is the realization that we don't build roads for cars. We build roads for transportation. Um, you know, on any day in Billings, you'll, you'll see semi-trucks, emergency responders, commercial personal vehicles, pedestrians, bicyclists, um, it, farm equipment. Um, it wouldn't surprise, I think, most of us to even see somebody on a horse in a certain part of town. And I seem to remember a story a couple years ago about a moose on 6th Avenue North. Um, you know, not every road needs to support every different type of transportation. Uh, but I, I do appreciate the, the comprehensive approach that we're taking, the Complete Streets Program. Uh, it's important, uh, and we need to pick and choose those, those areas where that fits and continue to build that out. Because like Tim says, if, they, if you build it, they'll come. Uh, it's just a matter of um, you know, ingraining that into our community uh, and helping people understand uh, more the benefits of, uh, of what we're doing and why. And I guess I'd uh, restructure the sentence to say, uh, what do you think about that rather than what do you feel about that? Just because it's dangerous to base public policy based on feelings. But I think if you just think about it, uh, the reality is that uh, people are using our trails more and more all the time. As we become used to it, uh, just as Tim said, we're gonna see more of it, especially after COVID-19. Um, we really understand the value of that. But um, what's the data? Uh, we, what is the data? I don't know. That's a bad thing that I don't know. <laughs> what do they cost? What, what do trails cost? Uh, uh, these other forms of uh, multimodal transportation uh, compared to vehicular traffic um, per trip or however you want to measure it. We need that data. Uh, we need to be doing a better job collecting it, not just as the city, but I'd say TrailNet. I would challenge TrailNet, other uh, organizations to collect that. Um, how do you measure it? Well, it's not just road construction, but maintenance costs and, and maintenance of a trail, uh, traffic enforcement, uh, police. Uh, it's very expensive to police a, a, a vehicular roadway with lots of accidents. Um, we, we just need that data. I don't know what the results are. <laughs> Uh, it could be that uh, uh, trail and pedestrian uh, ways per trip are very expensive. I don't know. Uh, maybe that they're substantially cheaper. Um, but even if they're expensive, there's an equity issue, there's a quality of life issue. Uh, but if we have that data, we could just make those choices uh, more clearly. So um, that's it. Okay. Thank you. The next question will be started by um, Dennis. So if you want to pass the mic down, get ready. All right. And I did want to just say, you know, this forum is about movement. So if you're feeling stiff, you've been sitting for a while, feel free to stand up, stretch, drop your questions in that little green basket. Um, the next question is, actively commuting to school improves students' physical and mental health, cognitive development, and academic performance. And it saves transportation costs. In 2020, City Council identified safe routes to schools as a top 10 priority. If elected, how will you improve safe walking, biking, and rolling? And we'll, we'll start with uh, Dennis, and then if you want to pass it this way. So to Tim next. Uh, thank you, appreciate that. What you've got to do, you know, on a safe walking in school, especially out there by Ben Steele School and for the safety of the children. What you have to do, first of all, is kind of uh, have a traffic study because you want to know what kind of traffic study is going in front of that school at a certain times of day, of course, traffic, five o'clock traffic, and that's why we have the school guards out there also. But that's the most important thing to do first. I think you should do your priorities first and go step to step going into your study of the traffic, the school hours, 
And this would be much better, and we would have to look at that before we go to our next step, because our priority is the safety of our kids. And that's uh, what is my top pro pro priority, if I could uh, go again on that, is do your study traffic, which the city does a wonderful job on that, and they do a good job on what they do, in fact. Uh, all our city employees do well, very well, and they're here for the children. And that's what we should do in if elected to city council. That would be a priority. Actually, all my priorities would be the children in those school districts, and you have to do it right the first time. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> um, yeah, I would uh, continue on with the council priority. I, I'm glad it's in the top 10. It should be in the top three, probably, for safe routes to school. Um, I think about uh, Ben Steele and, and where I live, and that my kids, if they wanted to walk or ride their bike to Ben Steele, they wouldn't be able to do it, because 62nd Street um, is very fast and very narrow. And so at some point, I think you know 62nd is gonna be redone. And I think uh, we see currently with what we're doing in the city where we're going back into certain areas and saying, oh, this area needs sidewalks. That's right, we forgot to put those in when we came in here the first time. This area needs uh, this and this area needs that. The long-term vision, somebody needs to have that to say, okay, if we're gonna redo this street, let's make sure we do it right the first time so we don't have to come back in and make sure that there's a walking path, um, a sidewalk, a, a bike lane, if if people think that would be needed out there. Um, and so I you know, support the efforts of uh, Healthy by Design, uh, all the groups here that encourage these types of things, um, and I would continue to support that uh, as a city council person. Thanks. Thank you. I too would support uh, continuing um, continuing supporting safe routes and also growing them, um, enhancing them where we're needed. Um, I'm all about working with groups around uh, town, state, country, who uh, are advocates and cheerleaders uh, for uh, health and also for for our families, so that they can that they can move around. And I think that you know, as our students learn. If they start learning early about physical activity and taking advantage of the trails and so forth, they will grow to continue to use them and, and I think utilization will also increase. So I think it's really important that, again, we take advantage of the public information officer to work with the committees and, and, and all who uh, contribute to uh, safe routes and, um, and help us spread that word and increase the number of uh, students who use the route and parents and, and all of us. Um, I know, I mean, at the beginning it just talks about how the uh, active community into school improves students' physical, mental health, cognitive development, and academic performance. Um, I mean, I, I have really, I know that's true. I mean, I, I knew when I, we went remote with the pandemic that uh, I suffered. Uh, and uh, when I went out, start biking or running and made use of the trails. Um, I really improved my mood, my motivation, my energy. I, I absolutely believe that would be help, really helpful for our kids. So I take very seriously um, you know, that, that kind of uh, information that's provided. You know, city council, what would we do? Uh, if I were in city council, I mean, we're working at a higher policy level. I'm not gonna be going out there and actually doing studies or things like that, but I'm going to be, um, I wanna be, I'm support, very supportive of, of those efforts for, for safe routes to school um, and, and would provide the, the adequate funding. And getting more specifically into things that I, um, what I would have said with the second question is, is I think we need, when I talk about reprioritizing um, where some of our transportation money goes, um, I would designate um, more than we are currently spending for walking and, and bicycling infrastructure. Um, between our arterial fees and our gas tax money, um, we have $22 million allocated this year. Um, and right now our current walking mode percentage is about three to 17% of, of trips, uh, depending on if you count just commuting versus uh, all trips. 
and our current biking mode is one to 8%. Um, so this year we're spending about $220,000 on, on bike infrastructure, which is about 1% of our, our transportation budget. Uh, and going forward, I would like to double that. Um, similarly with walking infrastructure. Um, around the country, walking and biking follows well-designed infrastructure investment. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks, Ed. Um, there's broad support for this issue on the city council, regardless of uh, council members' individual political outlooks, uh, which is great, and I really uh, commend them for that. What would I do? Well, it's for difficult for one person to uh, change the direction of that big battleship, um, but uh, uh, trying to enforce what we've already got in place is really critical. More specifically, I would try to do what I did this morning, uh, for example, which in involves just a lot of uh, uh, conversation with people. For example, um, <coughs> I uh, 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 picked up the phone and I, I, I learned about a major development between Fifth Avenue and Sixth Avenue in, in the eBird that's likely to occur. Um, I called the uh, developer's representative to quiz them a little bit about whether they are focused on the development and taking advantage of the Fifth Avenue trail corridor. As you probably know, there's no Fifth Avenue, but there is a trail corridor that goes down there that could be turned into an amazing bike and pedestrian and maybe even vehicular uh, access way to connect Metra with the downtown. Yes, they're very focused on that. I asked him if he could put together some pretty pictures to create momentum in the community for uh, the, the, the trail development. He, they, he said, yeah, they hadn't really thought about that, but he committed to doing that. Um, similarly on 6th Avenue, because they butt up against that, uh, we need a way to get people safely from the heights into the, the downtown or Ebird area by bike and by pedestrian. Uh, 6th Avenue has carries tremendous uh, vehicular traffic, but uh, it's very, very difficult for bikers and pedestrians. Um, and he agreed to uh, definitely focus on that. Uh, then I got a call from a uh, uh, property uh, owner on the rims uh, who's interested in trail development up there and asked for my help to try to make that happen. Uh, Monday night, um, the council was uh, addressing future development on Alkali Creek Road and you know, I asked the developer, are you committed to a trail along that arterial? And he said yes. So a lot of us just having those individual conversations and uh, pressing forward. I think we need to set expectations um, in terms of safe routes to school that if you have a property uh, that's along a, a route uh, to school and you do not have a, a developed sidewalk yet, that it's going to be completed in the next five to ten years. I think this is just, we, we need to get this done. It's time to stop talking about it and just go forward. Um, and so I think we should set that expectation. One of my personal pet peeves is sidewalks that stop and start. A couple of years ago, we uh, finished Central Avenue uh, out in our ward. Uh, and when they did that, they completed the last, uh, they completed 36th Street West uh, to make that a through road from Central down to, to Monad. Um, and it, it's a nice road now. And there's sidewalk the whole way, except for 300 feet from Central to, uh, I think it's Mount Rushmore. I'm, I'm, I can't remember the name of the street. Um, because there's an undeveloped property right along Central Avenue there. Um, that bugs me. It, there, there's no reason uh, that people in a neighborhood should, should have to walk on the street for 300 feet because there's an undeveloped property between their neighborhood and a major arterial street. That sidewalk should have been completed and the, the cost can be deferred until the developer actually develops that lot. Just put it in an account somewhere and say this is a future IOU. Uh, but I think we need to do that all around the city and just get these projects done. Yeah. So, thank you. <laughs> All right, um, and this question, um, for the purposes of passing the microphone, we are going to start with uh, Ms. Hernandez, and uh, we're going to go to her left. Left, right? Okay, left. Um, All right, currently, and, and this feeds into the last question, I believe. Currently, there is no reliable federal, state, or local funding source dedicated to trails or safe routes to schools. In, instead, Billings often relies on unpredictable sources such as grants to make projects happen. Would you be open and supportive of developing funding for trails and safe routes? 
Do you have any ideas about how to do that? Many years ago, I was asked uh, by Larry Martin and John, um, uh, John Jones to uh, put together a campaign for Amon Park Development Council to develop Amon Park. And um, one of the things that um, occurred is that the, the city asked that there also be some funds set aside for continued maintenance. Now, I'm sure that's not enough to take care of all maintenance because the park also grew and so forth, and, and th those were the early years when, when I was there. Um, yet I think that's a good idea, to, that as we develop some of these things, that we also consider putting aside some funds to, for further maintenance and development um, um, of, of routes and, and what we're asking for. I think that this again comes with bringing people together from the private, public, and nonprofit sector. There are so many unfunded mandates. I'm really used to working with unfunded mandates and filling in the gaps. So it really takes all three sectors to come together and to leverage anytime there is uh, some monies or whatever from one area to leverage those funds to look for additional sources. Uh, sources like the Murdoch Foundation or Kresge or Robert Wood Johnson and Otto Bremer. There are some folks that will address capital uh, projects when there is collaboration. And I think that's where good planning uh, really makes a difference. So I think there are ways to, um, to continue to add to the funds uh, because we know that um, we know that our residents are not um, open for more taxes and such, so we just need to work together as the private, public, and nonprofit sector to solve these issues as we continue our conversations. Yeah, I think this is an issue um, that the Parks Board has been trying to tackle, at least for my four years on it. Uh, when I uh, recently served for four years, uh, this was the main thing we talked about, was how do we get funding a, a consistent, um, funding source for these things. Um, and, and obviously there's, there's no great answers because the Parks Board has been working on it before I started there. And um, so it's, it's definitely a thing, but I, I think it comes down to this. I'm absolutely supportive of having these, and I really think it's the city's responsibility to provide uh, this basic civic infrastructure. It shouldn't be the role of a nonprofit or a church group or a neighborhood to rally together to build a sidewalk for the city. Uh, we pay taxes here. Our tax money should go towards basic civic infrastructure. That's safe routes to schools, trails, parks. Um, I think the extra amenities, you know, if, if we want to go above and beyond, then that's where those groups come in. And that collaboration really makes a difference. But I believe it's the role of the city to provide basic civic infrastructure. Thank you. Well, I'd have to think about this a little bit. I do believe that we should all work together. So I do believe we should have public, private, you know, funding, also federal, you know, for our trails, our parks. I think it's very, very important that we all work together because this way we could get the people back together, collaboration. And it's very, very important to make all these work together so we can move forward and so we can move, move our city forward. Like once again, I believe that we should use all the funding we can get. Thank you. So Safe Routes to Schools and other um you know, pedestrian transportation, it breaks down into kind of three uh, categories. Uh, the sidewalks, as we kind of talked about, I appreciated this year, council allocated a little more money to do uh, sidewalk development uh, than in previous years. I think that was a little, uh, little too little, uh, not quite enough. Um, there are multi-use paths that go along, uh, you know, streets, uh, major arterials in the city's right of way. Uh, we've got a complete seats program now that, that makes sure that as those uh, roads are updated that that is uh, considered and, and those um, resources are put in. Um, so I like that and I, I would continue both of those. Uh, but as far as the dedicated trails go, uh, we don't have a source for that. Um, this past year, or actually this year, the Parks Board put a, a, 
a, a plan in front of council uh, to develop uh, our undeveloped parks, and we included several trails in that uh, um, plan, the Stagecoach Trail and the Canyon Creek Trail, uh, to complete off our, our marathon loop. They fall squarely in that uh, dedicated trail uh, uh, category. Uh, council obviously this year is, is uh, decided to, to focus on public safety, and I support that. Uh, but I hope uh, that next year we can get this on the ballot uh, so that we can um, start building out these unfinished projects and have a dedicated source of, of funding to, to get through them all, uh, whether they're parks or trails. I don't have any problem with asking the voters to, to do these projects. Uh, if, I think if we put a good plan together, uh, make a reasoned uh, request, uh, something that's conservative and that it doesn't uh, throw at them you know, $200 a year, uh, I think that the voters will support that. There's enough demand in the community, and I think we can get it done. What Tom said. Um, uh, I don't see any alternative. So yes, do I support that? Yes. Um, but after public safety, uh, that is our top priority now. Um, I don't see any way to get meaningful change here without the voters approving it to tax themselves. Uh, that means going out for a bond or mill levy, probably with parks because, uh, yeah, it's hard to distinguish between trails and parks, both politically and as a practical matter. I do think, back to Mary's point, um, although I agree with Tim, that these are public resources that have to be predominantly funded by the public that benefits. Um, the public, or I'm sorry, the private sector is a great resource here. Uh, these things are sexy. They're a lot sexier than a lot of other things that government does. Uh, improving your parks, developing parks, developing a trail system has real public appeal. And so um, <clears throat> should they pay for predominant, you know, the, the majority of those costs? Of course not. It's not practical and it's not fair. However, it produces good political momentum when you can say, hey, a quarter of this cost is being paid by the private sector. It confirms the need and the desire and reduces the cost for the, for the taxpayer. Similarly, we need to work harder at getting those federal dollars. Um, uh, our, our success in getting the build grant uh, proved that it is not a total fool's errand to chase federal dollars. Uh, you may only get, get it every 10 years, but hey, that still adds up. And so we need to continue to work hard, condol or condolences, appreciation to TrailNet and others who worked hard on that. Um, and uh, we just need to continue to pursue those uh, dollars. Uh, but we do have to have a way to match those private dollars with public dollars, and that's the, the difficult uh, challenge. Yeah, I think the, um, I th we, we do need uh, dedicated local funding for, for, for trails, but we also need it for things like bike lanes and, and um, other walking infrastructure. Um, and so uh, in order to get those kinds of grants, federal or, or nonprofit, uh, you need to have some skin in the game. They're looking for that. So having something dedicated and then, you know, if you get a grant, it's bonus, right? But we need to have something all, that keeps us moving all, all along. And so part of that is, is, as I mentioned earlier, for things that are in the street uh, public right away, the, um, that we do have a, just a smaller, I mean, uh, we can double the budget for those things with just um, uh, a tiny percentage change in terms of where we're reprioritizing our existing funds. When it comes to uh, trails, you know that trails are, are both in, in the, our, our public right of way, uh, that's public works, and they're also both in, in, in our parks as well. And you know, I think with the what the uh, state legislature has done, uh, that means our, our parks district is going to have to go before the voters. Um, and, and in the next couple of years. And, and I'd be really interested in, in talking to people like, like Tom, who are very knowledgeable on, on, on the park stuff. Um, how, do we, how do we go about um, knocking off some of these big uh, capital projects uh, in a, a bond as a part of potentially this, this, uh, this um, uh, levy as well? And I'd like to see us, um, you know, knock up a big chunk of the marathon loop um, so that we can um, and you know, we, I'm happy to pay for that for the next 20 years, 10 years, whatever it takes, but I'd be very supportive of that. Um, 
taxpayers deserve transparency. We need to make sure that when, when they, if they vote for something like this, that they see, they know which projects are going to happen that year, and they have an expectation. They know what they're voting for. That's not just serve a blank check. So that's something I'd really like to see. And I think the a public information officer can also be very helpful in, in um, uh, getting that word out. Thank you. Um, before I forget, um, it, Bill uh, Cole just reminded me, um, Billings Trailnet will be giving uh, the city of Billings $85,000 on July 26th at the Billings City Council meeting uh, for the Skyline Trail. So please do join us at that meeting. Um, now to question six. City Council has adopted several plans, including the Billings Area Bikeway and Trail Master Plan, the Billings Growth Policy, Billings Parks and Recreation Master Plan, um, and the city's city council's uh, annual priorities list. These plans help our city be competitive for funding opportunities and they help us reach our city's goals. As a city council member, how would you support moving forward with the plans that have been adopted by uh, prior councils? So we begin with Tim Warburton this time. And I believe we had the opposite direction, that way. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> You're the boss. I'll, I'll pass it whatever way you would like. Uh, yeah, I think um, having served four years on the Parks Board and knowing the amount of time, energy, uh, commitment that goes into that, um, I would say I, I value the people that serve on these boards um, you know, across the city. Uh, the planning board, the, um, you know, anybody that's involved in that, um, I trust that they're there involved because they care. And I trust that they're looking at all the information and then presenting the best information to council. Uh, that's what we did uh, during my time on the parks board. Um, and so I don't really feel like there's a need to, uh, just because I'm coming on the council, I would need to go, let's redo all these master plans and let's make sure that I agree with every single thing. No need to reinvent the wheel um, just because I'm here. We pick up the work that's been done by uh, people that are invested in the community and keep carrying that forward. Um, I've often been frustrated uh, with the slow, sometimes, you know, Wheels of change can be slow sometimes, but I think when you're talking about um, taxpayer money, that's also an okay thing, making sure that um, the taxpayers are getting um, their value and their money's worth in that. So while it can be frustrating, um, sometimes it's very slow. Uh, I would pick up the plans that are there, um, support the things that, you know, that we've already been talking about here today, and... Um, use my time to, to say these are the things that, that councils before me have prioritized. We're gonna work on those, but also we need to be looking towards the future and making sure uh, those priorities are in place as well. Um, I agree with Tim that uh, it's not about reinventing the wheel because there are a lot of smart people, as I've stated before, that have served before us. Um, it's really, so I often step into uh, projects that are, are in the middle. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it's beyond starting. Uh, it's always good to uh, reevaluate, to go in, assess, evaluate where the project is or where the plans are or whatever we're interested in what's been done before and, and where are we today and you know, where do we pick up, where do we go from here. Uh, I think it's really important that uh, the measures to that, whatever we plan to do, that there are measures that are attached to that so we know when we've accomplished something, whether they be small things or large things. Uh, and I think that's where the transparency of what city council becomes really important and, um, and we would, you know, I'd want that to continue and to improve uh, because we can always improve on how uh, we get communication out, information out and answer people's questions. I think it is about bringing people together like many, you know, uh, 10 years ago, some years ago, we had community conversations and those happen from time to time too with the city. So providing our citizens opportunities to contribute their ideas, their thoughts, 
that's where we got some innovative ideas in those years that added to, that were added to the plan and I think that we need to ensure that we have opportunities for citizens to engage as much as possible um, and I just think there's a lot of work to be done as we continue. I tend to research a lot whenever we, whatever issues come up, and there's always a multitude of issues that, at hand at any given time. So um, the war continues. Um, these are all good plans. They all had a, a good process for, for getting input from a variety of stakeholders from the public. Um, I, you know, I, I some of the some of them are getting a little older now. Maybe there are maybe a few little adjustments. Time has changed. You know, time is. You know, some of these things may be a little outdated, and, and some changes, adjustments might need to be made. But um, I absolutely support them. And, and um, yeah, they, as we said, the, the, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Um, and uh, I I really respect the work that's gone into those thing, kinds of things. I'm a, I'm a design professional. Um, I know the process that we go through to, to put these things, kinds of things together, and um, there's a lot of research uh, that goes into that. Um, you know, I think in terms of, of uh, sort of riffing in off of what Mary was talking about, and maybe she's riffing off of me as well, in terms of, of the sort of transparency, I think I would really like to see our city at a place where um, every year, like this, these, are the, these are the priorities for the parks department in, in particular. Um, these are the projects we're going to implement, um, and you know there's going to be a, uh, some report at the end of the year. You know maybe some things happened. You know uh, pandemic happened, right? Some things aren't going to happen uh, because of uh, things. People, voters understand, the uh, residents understand, taxpayers understand. Um, but it, just having an, a sense that there's a there's a plan that's being implemented, I think that's really needed. Um, I think I think it, would, you know, in the absence of good information. Um, you just you you breed distrust and apathy, and, uh, and that's just not a good uh, ingredient for moving our community forward. So, um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, how would I move forward with these various plans? Uh, I would focus on just enforcing what's already there. Uh, some of the things that have come out of those plans over the years have been major advancements, like. Uh, requiring boulevard walks instead of curb walks. These are the, the, the minutiae that you get into when you're on the city council. Boulevard walk is, has that separation between the road and the sidewalk where, where um, uh, that gives you some distance from cars, um, but most importantly, it gives a place to put the snow so that uh, in the winter you can actually use that sidewalk. Uh, requiring construction of sidewalks. We didn't always used to do that. Uh, we didn't also always used to provide subsidies on corners, which the city does now. So anyway, enforce what's already there. That's the starting point. But also trying to help the public and groups like TrailNet and other organizations broaden the base of public support so that uh, more people can communicate with city staff, with uh, city council members, county commissioners to get the message across of what's important to them. Um, one thing that uh, I would recommend uh, very specifically is reading these things. The problem is you can't, it, it's very difficult. City Council, just this week, you know, a couple days ago, we got a stack, 500 pages, that's our, our, our packet for Monday. Um, 13 long items uh, on the council. You just can't go through it all. So if TrailNet, other organizations can take from these plans the, the, the pages that are the most significant from their perspective and consolidate them into a booklet and, and get that out and get uh, people to read that uh, uh, Cliff Notes version, um, I think that would be very, very helpful. Having public meetings to make sure that uh, uh, those key points are communicated each year, especially for new council members, uh, because otherwise it's just a very daunting task. Yeah, we've got no shortage of plans, um, as the question indicated. There, there are lots of them out there. Uh, I think where we've had challenges in the past is putting those plans into action. Uh, as the chair of the Parks Board, uh, it's been extremely frustrating for me to see all these wonderful plans, uh, master plans being put together, uh, whether it's Colson Park or Castle Rock or Centennial or Poly Vista, um, and, and our Parks Department uh, 
gets them in front of council and gets them approved, but they don't present any strategy for actually finishing the project. Uh, and it is so frustrating uh, because then it's, it, it's just a hurry up and wait situation. Um, so I definitely support the implementation of, of plans that have been approved. Uh, unless something has fundamentally changed, uh, I, I'm not going to waste taxpayer money and city and council time uh, rehashing, redebating plans that have already been approved by prior council. As, as Tim mentioned, a lot of smart people have come before us, um, and I'm, I'm just not going to do that. But what I do expect is I expect uh, departments to bring plans forward uh, in a, an organized, structured manner that, that lays out the resources that they need to accomplish those plans. Uh, and then count, as council, we have to you know, balance those. We can't do everything all in one year. Um, there's always going to have to be choices that have to be made. Uh, but it, it's up to the, the departments to bring forward plans, that, that, um, to bring forward strategies that actually accomplish the plans that have been approved. Uh, it's just something that I haven't seen from the Parks Department. As I mentioned, it's been very uh, uh, frustrating. Uh, the only other thing I'd say is when we look at those, uh, those strategies, those plans that are brought forward, uh, personally, I, I want to really favor plans that have measurements uh, uh, of transparency and accountability built into them. Um, you know, again, with the, the Parks Department, as, as I forget somebody uh, indicated, it's just something that we haven't seen in their CIP, their planning process, and we need to do that. I think the Public Works Department does a great job of that, and we need to adopt some of those uh, practices throughout the rest of the city. Thank you. I agree. Um, what you have to do, you have to follow your plan. Let's say you uh, say we have certain steps to take. Then you do this, you do this, follow in order. Then you get up to the master's plan. What's happening? It's not going to happen. What I would do is to educate the people. What's a master? I have, this has happened to me before about the parks. People says, what ward do I live in? What's a master plan? You know, to educate the our constituents, because some people do not know. But once you do know, you actually know where, what steps each person is taking. But once you get the master plan and it's not working, it should be started over again. You know, if it's not working, it's not working. But you could probably tweak it, the master plan also. You could tweak it, but you'd have to educate the people. But once again, like the parts, as my uh, opponent says, you know, you have to do these steps, and they have to be all together, and they do have to work. Of course, you could take a hypothetical and say, okay, we have a parks department. Here's what we're going to do in our little box. You know, well, that's not working. Let's just go over to another box and start all over again. That's not going to work. Once again, three three working all together. They have to work all together. And one thing on council I would do is educate the public, as I have stated before, on what council can do and what they cannot do because they are limited. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we are, oh, you haven't gone yet? Yeah, he was first. Yeah. Uh, I was like, wait a minute. Okay, so um, what we've decided to do is at this time we're going to shift gears a little bit. So this is going to be your last call for putting your questions in this lovely green basket that Rukia is sharing. Um, as you are maybe scribbling down those last questions, getting them over to Rukia, we're going to throw one more at this group, but you only get 60 seconds to answer. So get ready. Um, everyone has had a chance to start a question, right? So we'll go full circle, and uh, Mayor Cole, you'll start us off, and then you'll pass it down. Um, progress for our community depends on working with other, other governmental jurisdictions, including county commissioners, state legislatures. How would you promote a collaborative relationship with the county or your legislatures? Thank you. Uh, and I'll apologize in advance. I've got a 2 o'clock meeting, so if I jump up and have to run off, it, um, it's not what the last person said that, that it somehow offended me. Um, uh, the county is uh, important in this mix, uh, not so much on these issues, but on many other issues. 
And uh, I think uh, there was a book, you know, everything I, I really needed to know I learned in kindergarten. It's really true. Uh, we're still a, a small town of relationships, and there's just three county commissioners. So the most important thing I think that uh, anybody can do is maintain a good uh, personal relationship or professional relationship uh, with the commissioners and with county staff. So um, uh, you can do that by just attending their meetings, uh, meeting with them informally, um, uh, not going out of your way to uh, uh, slam them publicly <laughs> if you disagree with them. Uh, we had a good relationship on the build grant. It, it, it wasn't easy. I mean, we had to make some compromises there. Oh, I'm sorry. So um, go back to kindergarten. That's the answer. <laughs> um, and I also add MDT staff, the Montana Department of Transportation staff, also uh, important player in all this too. And so yes, go back to kindergarten, we need to have fun, friendly working relationships, uh, identify areas of, of common interest. Uh, sometimes it, it takes doing the math and demonstrating that, um, uh, you know, maybe having informal uh, uh, settings for meeting them with a, a small group of uh, council members so we don't we have a quorum. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess, it's ever required, uh, if we ever need to stick, just uh, firmly remind um, the commissioners, for instance, where, you know, that the majority of their constituents live within city limits as well. But um, I don't think that's gonna get for you or any, really anywhere, probably. So I think we'll just stick with kindergarten. Well, I'm all about bringing people together and finding, finding commonality. And then, um, and then going from there. I mean, I think that it's important to be able to talk about the issues that are in, uh, that most concern us at any given time. And I believe that um, you know it's important to be able to share um, share opinions and be comfortable with uh, disagreeing uh, people who disagree with us. You know, being. Uh, you know, accepting that and, and being gracious with one another. Because I don't know anyone, and I've been married for a long time, with whom I agree with all the time. You know what I mean? Whether I live with them or not. So um, I think it's really important about um, that we build relationships and invest in really um, working to um, uh, work together in, in um, solving issues. It's about the greater good. Well, I was a big fan of my kindergarten teacher, so I'd be okay going back if we had to. Um, you know, I think the, the biggest difference between county commissioners and city council members is the, uh, one of them is a part-time job and one of them is a full-time job. And I would be happy to sit down with any of the commissioners at any point um, and have that discussion. I think that collaboration is important. I also think it's important for us as uh, council members and the citizens to realize that we have somebody that, that does this work for us in our city administrator, and he's paid very well. Uh, we pay him a very high salary to work on those relationships, um, cultivate that um, collaboration. And so I would trust, and, and I have the utmost trust in Chris, that if he wanted me to write a letter, make a phone call, if he thought that would be helpful, he would let me know, and I would be happy to do that. Um, but we have some good people um, already that are helping foster that, that relationship. Thank you. I'd like to tell you, I've had 13 years relationships with the county and the city. And communication, as Mayor Cole would say, the number one priority is diplomacy. Be nice to everyone. Because that does really make a difference in the city, you know, on working together, the county and the city working together, the city sheriffs, the police, those two working together also. So once again, me working with the city and county for over 13 years is diplomacy and diplomacy is a major factor. 
Well, I've heard from so many people that the relationship between the city and the county needs to be improved, and nobody has any idea how to do it. Um, it's really, it's tough. And besides the, the personal relationship building that I think we have to do, I think we have to approach it from a position of generosity. It doesn't matter if it's Laurel or Custer or Broadview or Lockwood. All these communities, their success is our success and vice versa. And I, so I think what we need to do in Billings is, is have a period and just start um, doing anything we can, can to enable the success of these smaller communities in the county. Um, and not expecting anything in return. Um, and it, it's, it's kind of a kindergarten thing, I guess, but um, I think if we can do that and do it consistently over time, uh, that relationship will improve. I mean, I don't ever want to hear that Billings is causing problems for anybody else in the rest of the county or only thinks about the city's concerns. Uh, I think, you know, if anybody can say that, we're losing the battle. Thank you all. Okay, now we have the, the questions um, from the audience, and it, several of these are uh, very similar, so I'm gonna um, pick just a few with the few minutes that we have left, and each, give each of you an opportunity to answer it. If you would like to answer it, you've got 30 seconds, just raise your hand, and then hopefully we can get through. Um, if you don't wanna answer it, that's fine. We'll move on to the next question. So, um, uh, I live in a neighborhood that has no daily needs within it, school, grocery store, et cetera, and is separated on almost all sides by MDT routes. But it seems by their recent development and coming plans that MDT doesn't care about pedestrian, bike, or equitable access, and only to move more cars quickly. As a council member, how would you work with MDT to make sure they meet our complete streets policy standards and the local demand for livability and walkability? Anybody want to answer that one? Ed, 30 seconds. I mean, I think it does require a city response. I don't know as an individual council member that I would have much influence or, or a, a lot of influence at least, but I, I think it is, um, I think we don't do enough. Uh, I think there's opportunity to do more in terms of, of, of really bringing, MDT is, is uh, has these route through our community and uh, this needs to work for our community and uh, it's, and they need to be, uh, there is, uh, with, uh, yeah, so. Sorry, yep. anybody else wanna answer that one? Yeah. Okay, Mary. I would say that this is where uh, having community conversations are crucial. Uh, particularly when uh, it is not meeting one of the expectations of the plans for the city. So uh, in short, I would say, who's missing in the conversation? What do we need to address? And then uh, again, I would agree with Ed. It's not a, a thing that a single person can do. It's something that uh, the council would need to, or the city would have to come and, and help address that. But it's uh, who's missing at the table to make sure that we can fulfill the overall plan. Thank you. Anybody else want to answer? Thank you. I'll say, um, you know, I don't, MDT isn't going to have this kind of thing on its radar necessarily. And so I think that's why it's important as a city, we announce and educate everybody that these things are a priority to us. And so when you have your plan coming through, uh, these are our priorities. And this plan doesn't quite um, rise up to the standard that we'd like to see here. So what do we got to do about that? But we have to be clear as a community what our standards are and what our priorities for uh, are as far as that goes. Thank you. Anyone else? No? Okay. Uh, there are two that are fairly similar. Um, one is some of the keys to walkability are mixed use and density because then things are closer together. Do you support more density and more mixed use even if it means less single family zoning? Um, yes, <laughs> I do. Uh, I, I started to mention um, uh, that, you know, infill development has been uh, identified as a priority for a lot of the community, um, and I'll speak really fast. Uh, so uh, 
but we, we, doing the right kind of infill development actually benefits not just people living in uh, apartments or something like that above shops in an in in, uh, infill node. It, it benefits all the single family dwellings around it as well. Now they, now they live in a walkable community, uh, actually. So, um, uh, you know, we'll start with downtown. That's where we have the, the, the best opportunity. Uh, that's where we have the most done. But, but I think our, our, our corridors like uh, Grand Avenue, uh, Broadwater, Central, they are great opportunities for us to be uh, developing in, with different mixed use nodes. Go ahead and Tom. Yeah, I don't think we necessarily ha have to achieve that through less single family um, density. Uh, you know, we can approach single families a little bit differently. My neighborhood is relatively small lots uh, and, and that's just fine. I have less lawn to mow and that's great. Um, but it's much more walkable. And I, and I think the other aspect of that is allowing, and I think Recode allows uh, some more of this, but allowing things like a poly food market to, to come into a, a neighborhood, uh, whereas before we might have uh, not allowed those things. You know, if we can put those closer to our, our homes, uh, it's better. Anyone else? Yeah. I'll have to agree with Tom because uh, that is very good, you know, putting our grocery stores, stores in our communities. But I was on a zoning commission for uh, five years, and I can understand the multifamilies and the more brush and everything like that. Because once you have this uh, zoning and you go out and look at it, you do make a decision, and it does work. Thank you. Anyone else? I think it would be important for us to think about uh, multi-family um, uh, housing because I, one thing that is, I think, isn't the, well, okay. We also need to, talk, uh, to think about affordable uh, housing so that we have affordable housing for young families and folks that we're trying to invite into the community as well. And all of that, along with uh, the topic of today, is crucial to, uh, to have what families need to have a good life. Dan Brooks, do you, <clears throat> are you covering my back? I, I will, okay. Okay, <clears throat> you know. Um, density used to be a four letter word, it's not anymore. People kind of get it, that's a huge advance. We see great success with the Avenue C apartments, with uh, Shiloh Commons. Um, uh, and, and having those success stories are really, really valuable. Um, but we do need to find incentives for infill, especially for the redevelopment in Midtown. I'm thinking large parcels, be it the Elks uh, property, the, the Shrine, um, the, the old Gibsons. Uh, these are large parcels, but what is the incentive? We really don't have a good mechanism. Okay, we have time for one more question, as I've been told. We have three more that, or four more that have not been asked, so those will be um, online, yes? We'll email them. So, last question, many of you have referenced trails, <coughs> trails near where you live, and it seems they have been embraced in new development, but myself and many people I know live in and around the city where we feel like we all live on islands with minimal bike ped infrastructure that feels safe, comfortable, and convenient. How would you prioritize this? Ed. Um, so this year we will be implementing our first um, neighborhood bikeway, I guess is what I'm gonna call it. It's also known as a, a bicycle boulevard. We're, we're still coming up with a name for it. But this is a, uh, uh, something that can connect us to other uh, trails on the more perimeter of the community. Um, so it's a good way of, of, of making a, a sort of safe uh, priority for for bikes uh, on, on residential streets. Um, also, I think uh, cities should be looking at, uh, and has been in conversation with the uh, BBWA canal um, in, in, in exchange for perhaps uh, the work we're doing with them to make sure that our neighborhoods aren't flooded. Um, uh, maybe there's a, that, that's a two-way street that you need to give us access to uh, that right-of-way for some trails so we can actually have trails in the middle of the city as well. I think it's a priority with, the, and the way you tell the story about why these things are important to the neighborhood, um, and, and looking at the community health needs assessment, uh, it's done every three years, 
one in four residents of Yellowstone County, um, their deaths are attributed to heart disease or stroke. And, and trails uh, get people out, get people walking. And um, a business leader in that said, much of Yellowstone County isn't friendly to walking, running, or biking. Um, and, and that's kind of the perception that we have here. And so telling the story about why it's important and why it should be a priority is uh, how we do that. Thank you, I will be short. Uh, I watch commercial and I watch those trail nets and I see people on the trails in the snow riding their bikes and their daily walking. That is outstanding because people get out. And that does, again, as I stated before, improve your quality of life. But when I watch that commercial, you know, for the bike net and the trails, what we have here in Billings, Montana is outstanding because I didn't even know they could ride their bikes on trails, on the snow, walk, and everything. Thank you. Yeah, this is an extension of the Safe Routes to School uh, plan. Uh, we need to prioritize that, finish that, because it's about the safety of the kids, but then quickly move on to Safe Routes to Trails, Safe Routes to Parks, Safe Routes to Grocery Stores, whatever else. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Is that the, the last person who wants to answer that question? Thank you for, um, for attending. And I, I did want to say um, also, Ed Gulick was uh, talking about the, um, the Bicycle Boulevard. We're going to be having um, a table at the Strawberry Festival tomorrow um, from, uh, I think, 9 AM to 2 PM. And there will be information about the Bicycle Boulevard. So if you're interested at all in that and also what to call it, maybe not a Bicycle Boulevard, but something else, uh, please give your input. Um, we also have that in our e-newsletter. As far as anything else goes, uh, this will be published. The answers will be published on our website. And also, it's available on um, uh, Facebook Live with Community 7. Thank you so much, Community 7, for producing this and, uh, and making it available for anyone who would like to go back and, and watch it as well. Um, with that, I thank Jed Barton for, with Lyft. Um, they came up with wonderful questions. Um, and Melissa Henderson with Healthy by Design. Morgan, thank you so much. And thank you, City Council candidates, for agreeing to actually give up your lives for the next two years for <laughs> Every Monday, <laughs> four years, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, and, uh, and feel free to mingle. We do have to be out of here by 2.30. Thank you.